however you are celebrating the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, we greet you and bless you. A few years ago, New York Times reported a list of top trends across the world of all people, not just Christians, and one of those was Christians reconnecting to their Jewish roots, and this came about as they attended a Passover Seder. And that is the what research has shown the biggest trend amongst Christians. And we're amongst them. Uh, we have just hosted our 29th Passover, and every year it's very different. And there's so much to explore about the death and the resurrection of Jesus because he fulfilled every jot and tittle as the Passover lamb. So I have a guest with me today to chat about Passover and a well-known guest to everybody. It's Holmesy from The Breakfast Show and a Sports Live. And of course, Dave is also a member of the Tabernacle of David and our, on our worship team and a good friend. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, shalom. And um, so, Dave, many believers are discovering the depth of the Passover, and you have attended many Passovers, but recently you had an epiphany or aha moment about Passover. Um, just a couple of quick questions in this bit. What started you on the journey, and what would be one takeaway thought that you've discovered in this moment? Very, very simple, Ruth. Yes, I have always understood Passover. That's quite clear. Uh, it was all the other things in between, which in fact, I, I believe that in fact that we've been betrayed because of what actually happened in the 300 ADs. And mm. I'll, I'll probably don't have the time to talk about that. So yep. with the changing of the Sabbath to Sunday and everything else, uh, we've been, I've misaligned. So my, take, so my message, I really wanted to get in. And so what I wanted to do was to do a... Uh, a, a message at this time of the year around Passover that we wanted to actually look at the some of the characteristics of seven main figures is what we know as the, mm. the Easter story. Yeah. And as I started delving into that, I'm sitting there and I'm reading the words, I'm reading the scriptures, and I'm reading the words of Yeshua. And on five occasions, he quite clearly says that in fact that he will be buried and rise again after three days and three nights. Yep. And all of a sudden I'm going, uh, yes, okay, the words of Yeshua. Yep. Uh, so why is this Friday contextual of, of his crucifixion? Yep. Thus start delving in. So my takeaway is simply this, when you want to go in, please do your own study and go in and read the scriptures and yep. get a firm understanding so that it's a confirmation. So if you're minister or pastor says something don't always say that is that is the gospel or that it is go and check it out yourself and look at it and work it out and go hmm oh, no i i don't i don't agree with that and then that's where you be you like your opinion. be like the bereans and and say see what the mm. word says mm. so for me um, half of my life more than half my life i celebrated the traditional easter and the last supper and it was, as I said, around 29 years ago when we first hosted it. And the richness of it just really changed mm. the way I look at the Bible and all of that. And so the communion is birthed out of Passover and it's very rich. And each of the feasts of the Lord are prophetic statements, a demonstration of God's plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. And we want to emphasize Jesus is the Passover lamb. And the first Passover, of course, was Israel coming out of Egypt and being delivered from the demonic realm of Pharaoh. So even today, the Lord does really powerful things um, during the feasts. And so I always say, watch, look, see what God does in the world during this time. So in Psalm 81, it actually talks about the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and it you know, it starts off in, it says about you called in trouble and I delivered you. Mm. And it says, hear my people, I will admonish you. Though not worship any foreign gods, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. So there's a few things to think about as we listen to Joshua Aaron singing the sacrificial lamb.
beautiful song of Joshua Aaron singing about Yeshua, the Passover lamb. As I said, more than half my life was uh, the traditional Easter. And my epiphany really was the difference between our communion service and the Passover, where we have one cup in our communion services. Passover has four cups, but it's derived from Passover. And so it gives a, a real richness to it. But if, when you look at the, the Gospels, the writers were Jewish and they're writing to a Jewish audience who know all the Passover details. So really they're giving a report of what took place rather than giving a teaching to us Gentiles who don't have a clue about what <laughs> normally happens in <laughs> Passover. And so um, Luke chapter 22 gives us a little bit of clue. So we'll go through the, the four cups very quickly and show you there where it comes through. So the first cup is sanctification. And we know that God sanctified the Sabbath as a holy day of worship. And in Exodus 12, 14, the Passover was to be set apart as a holy day for the Jewish people, even in Egypt. And it was set apart to remember and honour the Lord. And today it's a national holiday in Israel. In Hebrews 10, 10, it says we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Mm. And Hebrews 13, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. And so we give thanks with the first cup at the Passover and thank him for the appointed feast and the revelation of prophetic truth and the plan of salvation and just bless the Lord, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by the blood of Yeshua in a blessing of his commandment. Mm. And the second cup, Ruth, is the deliverance. And I think sometimes when we mix that up, it's so important to recognise the deliverance, the taking out, the coming out, which is so significant. Mm. And, you know, it's not so much for slavery, but it could be cruelty, torture, abuse, yeah. being the, the orphan heart. And out of the kingdom of darkness and out of the hand of Satan mm. to come out, thank him for deliverance from all our fears and all the works of the devil that has impacted us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you through Yeshua. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have directed us from the power of darkness, from this present evil world system. By the blood of Yeshua, you continue to, live, to deliver us from every form of evil and give us the life in your heavenly kingdom. Thank you for the blood of Yeshua setting us free. All glory to you alone for all ages of eternity. Amen. And then the third cup uh, is called redemption. And we often put those together. So redemption is the, the, the deliverance is coming out of, redemption is coming into. And Luke 22 gives the clearest indication of which cup is which. Luke 22 verse 17 speaks of the giving thanks for a cup. Verse 19, he breaks bread. And then in verse 20, it says he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant, my blood, which is shed for you. The cup after supper means we actually mm. eat a full meal between the second cup and the third cup. And so the cups are there on the table, the, the, the bottle of wine or grape juice or whatever you have. And so after the meal, the third cup of redemption. And this is speaking of coming into, out of mm. Egypt, into the promised land, out of darkness, into the kingdom of light, out of fear, into the kingdom of the son of love. And so we can pray. We bless you, Yeshua. We've not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And we thank you, Yeshua, for your costly treasure of redemption, the total cancellation of sin. So we have a new nature. And you now see us as holy in your eyes, your beloved child. Mm. And the fourth cup is probably the fun one, I suppose. It's the hallelujah moment of it all, Ruth. That in fact, mm. when it's the cup of rejoicing, the joy and, and consummation, a taste of freedom beyond redemption. And you can find a number of verses, Colossians 3 and many others, Romans and Hebrews. But it's a picture of looking forward to the resurrection. Yes. And, and, and of course, his second coming. And a picture of the return of Yeshua. And that is when, in fact, we look forward to that consummation at the marriage supper 
of the lamb. And I suppose if there was a very simple prayer for this, uh, Ruth, you could just simply say, Lord, I am thankful that I'm no longer a slave to fear, torment, rejection, and abandonment. I am a child of God. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to listen to the beautiful song of Karen Davis, You Have Redeemed Us. Grace upon grace, and it is his grace that has redeemed us that we celebrate. In Mark chapter 14, verse 1, it says, After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take Jesus by trickery or deception and put him to death. In Luke 22, verse 1, it says, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew new, which is called Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So first of all, there's actually three feasts across mm. seven days, which is yeah. where the confusion could be oh, a little bit. Been, yeah. And so we tend to call the whole seven-day feast as Passover, but it's actually three feasts, and the first day is Passover. The second day begins the Unleavened Bread, and it goes right through the whole thing. And the third day is first fruits, which was when Jesus raised from the dead. And so the key, of course, is Yeshua is the Passover lamb, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 7. But if you are wondering about where I get those three feasts from, it's in Exodus 12, it's in Leviticus 23 and in Numbers. So basically the first day of the Passover is the 14th day of Nisan, where the Passover lamb is killed. And that corresponds mm. with the death of Jesus on the cross. The second day, or the 15th day of Nisan, is unleavened bread, which begins and lasts all weeks. And that speaks of the unleavened bread is no yeast. And, of course, Jesus has no sin. And that's, you know, leaven speaks of sin. And Jesus, the bread of life, is buried in the grave. Like a grain of wheat dies to produce a crop. And then the third day, the first fruit, Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection of the dead. And it's actually the time of the start to count the omer, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, in a moment. But it's really counting from when the seed is planted until you come to the harvest, which and then they count it all the way to Pentecost or the, the Feast of Shavuot. But Dave, it's a really a week of a lot of tension because it says there in those scriptures I read, they're plotting to kill him. So... Go it's, for it. Yeah. Well, look, where do you start? But we just say that, in fact, it is important to recognise, Ruth, that no matter what we are doing, even here in Bendigo in our church service, we must be remindful that the world still goes on. Mm. And whether in our little church or whatever it is, doing a Bible study, we <coughs> really have to be aware that, in fact, there's so much going on around us. There's yes. witchcraft, uh you know, awakening spirits and different things, whatever it is. And there's always this spiritual tension and it's never going to leave. And worshipping other and, gods. And, and this is the reason why, that in fact, the, the Jewish people had this unleavened bread because Yeshua spoke of the leaven of the Pharisees, the yes, hypocrisy yes, and the yes. blasphemy which they, they spoke. Mm. No, they yes. were accusing him of the same thing. Because, mm. So leaven represents uh, a sin. Yes. That's the reason why. It's taking you, and, and, and so they had to fast. But but the whole tension of it, and it, as a, we've been to Israel a number of times, yes. and around the feast time, oh. not, at, not at a Passover time, we've been no, to yes. Shavuot and also the Feast of Tabernacles a number of times, but it's such a high tension mm. because in Israel itself there's, there's a tension. Even though the, the people live together so well in the community, the Arabs Jews get on famously mm. well, yeah. but as soon as we come into the... Yep. into these times, even at Ramadan, which they probably do over there as well in that time, because you've got the, that part. Yep. But here, in the feast time, it is a time of conflict. Yes. And I was like, no, going for a run. Yes, you went for a run. The old, uh, uh, the, old, um, the old city, uh, and through that, it's a long swim up and going to go there. But the tension, and you could feel it. Mm. And so when you sense that, but then when you go and read the scriptures and look at the week, and I'll quickly go through it, it basically began that um, uh, about six months beforehand, that in fact, that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. Mm. He did it after three days. He did it on the fourth day, rose him up. 
And he was quite famous for that. He was healing people around uh, and going through. And it says from the, the sixth day, six days before Passover, that he left Jericho. It's a long walk. He was going to Bethany. He stayed there on the Thursday night. And he was there on the Friday night because that would have been the lead in to the Sabbath, being the yeah. third day. And the first part of the tension was, even then, the people were... If you look at the scriptures, there were a lot of people even at Lazarus's place because yes. they wanted to meet Jesus. Yeah. And they knew he was coming to Jerusalem mm. as well. And they wanted to meet this bloke again because a lot of his work was done around the Galilee. So yep. they were there. But the high tension was very quickly. The first part was, that in fact, the tension on the Friday night where, in fact, Mary anointed Yeshua with the expensive oil and the fragrance. Mm. And... Uh, Judas, he went in and sort of said, no, that's a waste of money. But Yeshua rebuked him. And then the next day he went in as the triumphant king. He declared himself the king. Because he had said before, my time's not for, uh, fulfilled earlier, but now he comes as the triumphant king. Then he got everyone, the Pharisees, uh, start to feel rebuked. As in fact, that all longer the people are cheering for this Jesus. Mm. And then... They then you got this conspiracy. When do we capture him? Mm. And they said, not the high, not the feast day. So you got this tension coming through the plot for Judas and going through, and the lead up to it uh, as that comes through, and the Passover they want to get there. The whole preparation of that, but Jesus was trying to fulfil that all the way. Even Judas wasn't mm. going to betray him that night, but yep. Jesus said, you must go and do it yep. now. Amen. And that's the tension. Yeah. And the other thing too is, as you know, the city is not that big geographically and mm. all the people were required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. So we know in our city, when there's lots of people, you've got extra traffic, you've got uh, all of that sort of chaos as well as the spiritual dimension. So... A beautiful song in Christ alone sums it all up. It's the gospel in one song. Mm. The message of the cross is the power of God. It's this power that we stand in. Out of Egypt, out of the hand of the devil, the deliverance out of, into redemption. And as Israel came out of Egypt, it took a long time for God to get Egypt out of Israel's heart. That's a good point. And that's that's where we go as well. We get saved and it takes a lifetime. And you get comfortable to those things which but you know aren't, aren't, aren't right, but just so yes. comfortable. Yes. Then. And so this whole tension of Jesus with the um, Pharisees and so forth is a real picture of it because he's challenging the mindsets. Yeah. And the thing that's really important in that whole struggle is the mindset of slaves. Israel was slaves for... Mm hundreds of years. And so you do, over time, develop a mindset that is strong. And so a slave feels used, rejected, abandoned in that sense of like not having a home, not having a place of belonging. And so rules of religion can be even give us a sense of security, mm. uh, you know, when you feel insecure. And so we see it outworked in Israel in the wilderness where they are grumbling and complaining against God. And it says, and, you know, we've talked about this many times, in Psalm 78 it says, um, they wounded the heart of God and mm -hmm. limited him being able to help them. And what a picture and a challenge for us, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, we see complaining all over our land, and especially as we're coming into the election, um, it's a strong picture of slavery when we complain and whinge about this, that, and the yeah. other thing, and of the orphan heart. And it's a really a reflection of the um, the the mindset of Egypt still being in control. Whereas Thanksgiving uh, really is a picture of us coming into deliverance that we're now a child of God. Um, and Jesus at the cross. It says he was despised and rejected by men. And we know that the father even turned his face from yeah. him. And so Jesus bore our rejection so we can be accepted in the beloved. And rejection is one of the most painful experiences of the human heart. And that Jesus walked through it for us um, means that we can just, it's a part of the cross that we need to really take hold of. 
um, when we go through those sorts of things. It says in, and it's part of the bitterness of Egypt, of the slavery. Romans 8, 15 says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption or full acceptance so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. Um, one of the translations says, you'll never feel orphaned for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him saying, beloved Father. Mm. And so it's such a powerful thing to know we're no longer a slave, but a child of God with a new identity, new DNA, new inheritance. Um, and that there is such liberty to come out of that uh, mindset. And so the challenges Jesus gave all through that Passover week, because, you know, it was a bit of a walk from the Galilee into Jerusalem and the tensions that you spoke of, is really addressing this heart that they needed to change. Mm. And this is the challenge to us. And he bore our rejection on the cross. Mm. It's so graphic that even when he was going to the cross, he was carrying the cross of Barabbas as a convicted yes. criminal and he swapped places. Yes. And Barabbas got off. He didn't know there was no merit of doing that. He took mm. it on there. He took the curse. And as I said, uh, you know, he, he wasn't taking the cross of Barabbas. He was taking the cross of David Holmes and, and, and Ruth, Ruth Webb and yes. everybody yes. else. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, it's when you think of that particular way, you go, Amen, thank you for that deliverance and redemption. Yeah, and, and when you really um, personalize it in that mm. way. So, what better song could we play but the Shane and Shane version of No Longer Slaves? Amen, what a powerful revelation that is that we take hold of it. Well, we know at 3 p.m., the day Jesus died. As he died at that moment, the veil was torn in the temple. And if you could imagine the scene over at the temple, not far away, a kilometre or two away from the crucifixion scene, the priests were slaying the Passover lamb at that moment. And at that very moment that he died, the veil in the temple splits from top to bottom. It wasn't someone went in with scissors and not could you is 80 foot high, and it's really heavy and thick. So they knew. Any one person can do that. Yeah, from top to bottom, from heaven. I just had an epiphany. Yeah. They, uh, can you imagine the noise of that oh, tearing? Yes. And they're slaughtered, and they're slaughtering the Passover lamb, and yes. they're probably telling, boy, boy, what is that? And plus the earthquake's <laughs> happening, and then people get raised from the dead and start walking around Jerusalem. <laughs> the chaos that you spoke about just escalated. Yeah. And... We're in 2022 right now, and right now on the feast, uh, sorry, on the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. even today in Jerusalem, it gets really wild. And in fact, there's rocks being thrown between the Palestinians and, and so forth. So it, it is an issue today. It's like every demon in hell comes out to fight against God. And really, that's what we saw. If you read Psalm 22, it's, it speaks about the bulls raging at Jesus. Mm. And so that's a real picture of the demonic um, coming at him. And so um, the veil being rent, it had gone dark. And I, I shared uh, a couple of times that Jesus is the light. And yet before he died, it went dark. And it's like the life was draining out of him on the cross and then as he dies the earthquake takes place and the veil is rent and of course the veil being rent it says in hebrews means that we now have intimacy before that only the high priest could go in there but we now because of the blood of jesus can enter into the holy of holies to the place of intimacy but it also speaks of the epiphany and we've been praying for the Jewish people to see Jesus as their Messiah, as their Passover lamb, as this moment comes in the Passover. But it also, for each of us, have been having this epiphany as we celebrate the Passover and get this understanding. What difference does it make in our walk with the Lord? Okay, I'm going to start at the, the, the veil splitting. Yeah. See, Jesus stands at the doorway of our heart, but also the doorway into his. Mm, mm. And he could either doors yeah. close or shut. That veil opened the door. Mm. So when Yeshua spoke the words, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. He's saying, I am the way. I have split that curtain yes. for you. Yes, yeah, it's good. This is the only way in. Mm. No other way. You can. You don't need an intermediary. Yes. You now have that relationship that, in fact, that we don't have to go to a priest or ask for absolution or whatever it is. We can just fall on our knees to go through that veil. Yeshua, we are at your knees. I need you. To be right, I am down. I have whatever it is. I want this fear to be conquered. I'm coming to you. You are the way. And when we acknowledge that, the truth light bulb moment. Yes. And yeah. therefore that gives us a new life as well. Mm. And the other thing is is on the days, and I think we can go into the days, and, and I think the unlocking was this confusion that, in fact, uh, where it says that, when he was crucified and he was buried, and they had to do it in a hurry because there was preparation day for the yes. Sabbath. Yes. Now, the big thing is we look at the dates, and the date was um, that itself was the 14th, but now we have on 14th the 15th of Nissan, yes, 14th of Nissan, yes, we have on the 15th of Nissan and going in. So we are now nearly got to sunset, leading in now to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was a holy. High day Sabbath. Yes. And so, like, therefore, it's where the confusion comes in. So it, so that yes. wasn't there. So, yeah, the Sabbath, and they had to get him down quickly. And it's the reason why that in fact you could not have anyone on a cross or being yes. crucified on a Sabbath day. Yes. And that's the reason why that they had to hurriedly go and break their legs. But Yeshua was already dead, yes. and they did, and fulfilling prophecy. Mm. And I love that. Uh, to me, that part where. He was pierced, but then that centurion just falling and going, oh, this truly is the son yes. of God. Yeah. Uh, that's just beautiful. And that was his epiphany moment yeah. when he's standing there watching the whole scene. And, of course, just to pick up on what you said there, in when God created the earth, the day began in the evening. Yeah. It didn't start in the morning. And so we look at the calendars yeah, and we go, go it. it's yeah, so and so it starts at sunset. And so when he speaks of the first day, it's from the evening. Yeah. And that's why uh, our because calculations could be. Back. So when he created, when in fact the earth was created, and we said it, it, it was, the spirit was hovering, it was dark. Yes. And then he brought the light. So therefore our day starts at night time. Yes. Goes, yes. Lovely. And you start with rest and then come into work. I and mean. which is a totally different mindset, which is wonderful. So what can you do but crown him with many crowns and give him glory because of what Jesus has done for us? So as we just give him thanks, we just want to listen to our rendition from our CD. Crown him with many crowns. Amen. We crown him King of kings and Lord of lords, for he has risen from the dead. He, the perfect son of God, could not be held. He could not be held by death. When Jesus arose on the third day, it was actually the first fruits, the feast of first fruits. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. His body could not decay because he is life. Life is in his blood. And it says in Romans 6, The glory of the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. What a powerful truth the resurrection is. Without the resurrection, we are, of all people, most miserable, Paul said. The Passover prophesied Messiah's death on the cross, and the first fruits was celebrated with offering the sheaves in the temple, and that's the, the wheat turned into flour and created into loaves and waved before God, then prophesied of the coming harvest, through Messiah's resurrection from the dead. He was the seed that went into the ground. And first fruits is about harvest after the seed was sown. And on the beginning at the feast of first fruits, they actually begin to count the Omer, mm. the 50 days. And the Omer is, is the um the bread and you know the, the sheaths that come in, the, the harvest. 
And what it's looking towards each day, it counts towards Shavuot or Pentecost, wow. which is what a profound oh, the picture. Honey, amen yeah, that. yeah, because it's like um, the seed's gone in, and each day yeah. we're calling forth the harvest oh, wow. of yes, souls. Yes, now, yes, this is what he's talking right. about: the harvest of souls because of the resurrection. Amen. And then when we come to what we know as Pentecost. That's when the harvest comes in. And so this is the beginning of the harvest is the resurrection. And so, you know, it just gives me goosebumps, you know, talking about it because it's like, it is the power of God. It is, it is the power of God. And so um, the resurrection day is, so this is the third feast of the three feasts in one, if you like. It so is, with, with Passover, uh, the unleavened bread and with first fruits, and so throughout the, we're remembering the, the the life of Jesus in the tomb, but the resurrection when it all cracked open, another earthquake as he raised from the dead, oh, and God. so this is what we celebrate um, as he's risen. So what better way to remember this is the most beautiful song of Karen Davis, where Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life." 